Hello, and thank you for joining us. I am your host, holistic behavioral coach, Jeffrey Biesecker. We are all on the journey to discover the light inside, that beacon which guides us to live our truest, most authentic self. This is episode 68. When you step back and take a look at the picture of your life, do you like what you see? If not, don't worry. You're not a jigsaw puzzle where every piece only fits in one place. You are a mosaic, free to alter the picture you were given. In a mosaic, every piece can go wherever you, the author and owner, want it to go. If you are ready to have the image of your life reflect the person you truly are, our guest today is ready to guide you, helping you call in and align the pieces of your mosaic so that what people see is who you really are. As a former corporate head, Danny Bruce Livin was the director of business development at Hay House, playing a crucial role in helping it grow exponentially over a 10-year period, turning it into a powerhouse player in the publishing industry. Danny walked away from it all, becoming an ordained rabbi, then spending 10 years as a monk, living in a monastery in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now as a much respected advisor and visionary, Danny is teaching others to discover how the connections they align determine the life you make. Tune in today to learn how you can become the author and owner of the mosaic of your life on The Light Inside. I want to share a little secret with you today about a podcast booking and matching platform I truly love. As a podcast host and guest, my go-to podcast booking app is podmatch.com. If you currently have a podcast, regularly guest on podcast, or if you are new to the podcasting game looking to start your show, podmatch.com is an industry leader. They quickly and effortlessly connect ideal podcast guests and hosts. Their process is super easy and highly effective. Create your free guest or host account and set up your profile. It's really that easy. And the Podmatch AI will work its magic in the background, delivering your ideal interview matches within minutes, tailored uniquely for you. As a host and executive producer of the Top 100 Self-Improvement Podcast, The Light Inside, I found more high-quality guests on Podmatch than anywhere else and in a fraction of the time. So if you're looking to expedite your podcast booking experience, fill in your calendar with high-engagement content, creating value and meaning for your listening community. Check out podmatch.com, that's P-O-D-match.com, today and discover your ideal match magic. In many ways, our guest today, Danny Bruce Levin, is a shaman. Knowing how to listen and articulate the thoughts of others in a much more meaningful way than they can objectively do themselves. Join us as Danny shares how we can each discover to more effectively piece together the mosaic that is life. Hello, Daniel. How are you? Hello. Oh, if I was any better, it would be illegal, my friend. How are you is the question. I am splendid. Doing well today. Good. I love that. Do you like to go by Daniel or Danny? Danny. I'm Danny. I'm not mature enough to be Daniel. Danny. Okay. (laughs) I know in all of our interactions, we went by Danny, but I like to try to be respectful. (laughs) I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. More so to sit back and listen to your perspective. Okay. Well, we may be in trouble. Because we may be two listeners listening to each other. 
we'll be okay. <laughs> so how do we want to frame this? I know we spoke to holding space for others yeah. and allowing their message to shine. So I kind of prepped that with the notion today that I was going to simply hold space for you to allow that message and that notion and message throughout the mosaic to step forward and shine. What a beautiful thing. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm so honored by your desire to do that. So let me put in context what happened for me in terms of listening. Because when I was given the assignment to listen, I literally started laughing because I went to the, to the one that knows more than I do. And I said to them, you must be really low down on your totem pole. Surely you can find somebody who listens better than me. I spend my whole life talking to people. And the answer my beloved gave me was really beautiful. She said, in fact, Danny, it would be good for you to learn to listen with your ears a little bit better. But that doesn't concern me. What I love about you is that when you speak to people, your words carry enough significance and importance that people allow their minds to get occupied in the stories you tell. And when they allow their minds to be occupied, fear lives in the mind. So fear gets occupied along with it as well. And what we've seen you do is as you speak to the minds of people, you listen with your heart to their heart. You listen with your soul to their soul. Because so often the words people say are not the words of their heart and soul. So we love that you talk a lot. But we, because we love the fact that you use that as a camouflage to really touch people's lives by allowing your love to penetrate their heart, mm -hmm. by allowing your soul to penetrate your soul. So I'm not a good secret keeper because better that I would have said that at the end of this podcast so that people wouldn't know the secret. But I love telling them exactly what's about to happen and allowing them to feel what's happening as it's happening. Does that make sense? Yes. I love leaning into this conversation today in this episode, looking at a quote directly from your website, asking ourselves and being available to listen in and hear when you look at your life, at the picture of your life, yeah. do you like what you yeah. see? So what I love about this book that I wrote called The Mosaic that I didn't write, it was written through me. And I, that always sounded weird to me until about a month and a half ago when I had a conversation with someone who was big in HarperCollins. He was the one that helped hmm. grow. As I'm saying HarperCollins, I'm thinking that that's not the right name. But he was, big with, he was big with one of the publishing houses that helped The Alchemist become The Alchemist, the third best-selling book of all time. <laughs> and when I told him the story of what I did, he said, oh, you're like Charles Dickens. That's what Charles Dickens did. He invited all of his characters to tea. These were mythological characters. He sat with them. He listened to them. He, he, he saw the way they dressed. He saw what they did. He saw the way their hands interacted. He saw the way they spoke. And then he just wrote what they told him to say. And so I said, that makes me feel so much better because I felt like some sort of weirdo psychic chat or guy that I'm not. I'm a, I'm a guy guy. I'm like a real, you know, guy guy. And so, but what I realized is that everything in life is speaking. Our body speaks to us. Our business speaks to us. Our environment speaks to us. The city that we live in speaks to us. The house that we're living in speaks to us. And if we would only get quiet enough to listen to that voice, we would start to be able to hear how to be in harmony with the world around us. So what the mosaic just showed me in the last month or so is that we're not a jigsaw puzzle, we're a mosaic. A jigsaw puzzle has every single piece goes perfectly in place. And I love the synchronicity of that, the beauty of that, that we all have our place in life. When we fit into our place, the picture of life is beautiful. But my life hasn't been that way. My life has been my piece fits in here for a little bit of time. And then my, I destroy the jigsaw puzzle and create a new one. What I realized is my life is a mosaic. 
And the the perfectness of a mosaic is that if you don't like the way your life looks, if your life is not in sync with who you actually are, you can rearrange the pieces of your mosaic. Mm. You can make it become a symbol of what you are rather than a puzzle of what you're not. There's a reason it's called the jigsaw puzzle, because it's puzzling that you have to be this person. A mosaic is not called a mosaic puzzle. It's called a mosaic because anytime you change, if your mosaic is, is, if you're aligned with your mosaic, as you change the pieces in your mosaic will change and adapt and they will become a perfect reflection of who we are inside. That's really the work I do when I work with people. I, I don't change them. I don't fix them. I don't help them. I don't correct them. I don't do any of that. I just love them and listen to them and care for them and acknowledge them so that they feel safe enough to drop the old picture, the walls that protect them. And suddenly when those walls are not there, we sit eyeball to eyeball and we rearrange the picture to allow what's inside to be seen outside. In your book, The Mosaic, you describe four key elements as playing a crucial role in drawing or rendering that picture for us, the self, source, purpose, and others. How do we better understand, first and foremost, ourselves to truly listen to our souls and to tune into the thoughts and beliefs of others? Love it. Beautiful question. Most people, if you would ask them what's connection, they would say what we're doing right here. (laughs) They would say, This is connection. You and I are speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. What's happened for me in my life is I realized that that wasn't connection for me. There were three steps that went before that. When I looked at myself over the course of 66 years, I realized I've spent a lot of time doing this. For anybody who's not watching, I'm hitting myself in my face. I spent a lot of time knocking myself down hitting myself, telling myself what I can't do, what's not good about myself. You're too old. You're too fat. You have white hair. Where did you go? Where, like, you're not young anymore. Who's ever going to be with you? What's going to happen? How, who's going to ever love you? You're, you lost a lot of money. You had a lot of money. Who's, how are you? All the stories of BS that means nothing. Just constantly hitting myself. At a certain point, those, those hits that I put on myself hurt. So I did this. I put up a wall. And when I hit myself, my hand hurt because it hit the wall, but it didn't hurt the rest of me. Now that would have been okay. Maybe if I knew I was always going to hit myself in my face, (laughs) but I got smart. As I saw the wall was at my face, I went to my chest and I hit here. And then I went to my groin and I hit there and I went to my stomach and I hit there and I went to my knees and my feet. So I had a, I had a silo (laughs) two millimeters from my beam. It protected me from anything, from my own assault. I wasn't worried about you hitting me because I hit myself way harder than you would. I know all the places that injure me much better than you do. And I was spending a lot of time injuring myself. So the protection felt good. But when I walked in my silo, what connection do I have with you? Hmm. There's a probably fairly good chance you have a silo too. So in most of the conversations that I was having, what was happening is my wall was meeting your wall and they were talking to each other. And I painted my wall beautifully so that you would like the painting that you saw on my wall, thinking that was who I was. Hmm. But I was the quivering kid laying underneath, hoping you never looked over the wall, hoping you would never see the guy that was scared to death of being discovered, of being the fraud, of if that facade wasn't there. Would you like me? Would you be able to accept me? Would you be able to to embrace me and hold me? Would you still believe in me? Would you still think I was an okay person if you saw me without my facade around me? Hmm. So how did I get rid of that wall? It's so easy. If I created a wall from hitting myself, then the quickest way to get rid of the wall is to stop hitting myself. So when I started a practice of be kind to myself, I created a 30 day, 30 consecutive day challenge for myself. 
to see if I could spend 30 consecutive days being kind to myself. It took me four months to get through day one. I had a little wristband that I wore that said, here it is. Mm-hmm. Be kind to you. I put, it on my, I put it on my right wrist and I started out. The first moment I started not being kind to myself, when I realized I wasn't being kind, I took the wristband off, put it on the other arm. You don't need my be kind to you bracelet. Take anything and just use it. It took me four months to get through the first day. I was changing that thing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But I wasn't concerned with how long it was taking me. Hmm. What I was beautiful, beautifully watching was the process of what it took for me to be kind to myself. It took me nine months to get to 30 days. I was on day 27. And then I said something unkind. I put it back on the other wrist and started again at day one. But that's the practice. When we're kind to ourselves, the walls are not needed anymore. Now I might walk into the world. Now suddenly my world went from a two millimeter container (laughs) to, whoa, look at what's going on out here, right? (laughs) There's this whole big world here. You with me? And we're missing the awe and wonder so often. Yeah, Mm -hmm. because we can't see it. How do we see it? We're right here. It's all... And we're narcissistic because all we're doing is surrounding ourselves with ourselves because we're scared to death of our own power. So once that wall came down, I went, wow, how the hell did all this get here? Like, where'd all this come from? And I started to realize there was one greater than I was. That it created all of this universe. And I stood in awe and wonder. And I thought, wow. If the one greater than I created all this, what would have happened if I allowed that one to help create me? And so the vehicle for that became relinquishing some of the control that I had on my life when I was in the silo and becoming vulnerable. It's not a word a lot of people like. Hmm. We think vulnerability is weakness. We think vulnerability is we're going to get taken advantage of. We think vulnerability is like, why would anybody want to be vulnerable? Yes. So true. What I found is in being vulnerable and emptying my cup, Hmm. suddenly the one that was greater than I could start to put things into me. When my cup was full, he put, he or she poured it into me and it went on to the floor. There was nothing that they, that the one greater than I could put into me that would be received. So now, I started to develop the practice of being kind to myself. That allowed me to take down the wall. That allowed me to connect to myself. I allowed the practice of vulnerability to allow me to be connected to one greater to myself, the source. And suddenly when I saw everything around me, you with me so far? Okay. So when I saw this big world around me and I saw this creator and I saw, wow, there's something going on here. Then I wondered, what in the heck am I doing here? Like, what's, what's my purpose here? What am I here for? Yes. Yes. And I realized this one that's greater than I doesn't need to make carbon copies of things to satisfy their ego. We live in a world where everybody tells us, if you do what I do, you'll be successful. Follow these rules. Do what I'm doing. I'll give you the blueprint. Just go like this. You'll be successful. And people do get successful. But that doesn't mean they are fulfilled. Because somewhere along the line, we weren't here to do what other people are here to do. We're here to do what we were created to do. They say there are two most important days of the day you were born, the day you figure out why you were born. When we understand our purpose, when I started to understand my purpose, Hmm. that became the guideposts for everything that I was doing. I started to create the interactions that I had in my life. So now three practices emerged. The practice of being kind to myself, the practice of being vulnerable to a world that's bigger than I am, to one that's bigger than me, and to a purposeful way of being in this world, allowing that purpose to enter me and fill me and guide me. 
it was then that the fourth step could happen, connection to others. And the great archaeologist or anthropologist, Margaret Mead, who used to say, throughout all of civilization, the only time changes happen is when a small group of people came together and initiated change. Hmm. It doesn't take thousands and millions and billions of people. I'm a Jewish boy, but Jesus, Jesus did it with 12. And it doesn't take a lot of people when, when kind, vulnerable, purposeful people come together. It doesn't mean they believe the same thing. They can have unlike beliefs. <laughs> but when they come together, magic happens. <laughs> and that fourth step is that's when we build our mosaic. And our mosaic is made up of beautiful diversity, diversity of thoughts, of colors, of nationalities, of religions, of economic welfare, of, of sexuality. When all of that comes together, what we create is what was always intended to be created. The unification of all things, the connection of all things, the interaction of all things. You're a good listener, but I better shut up and let you say something. <laughs> I'm listening in. I'm listening no, I, Hey, this is amazing to me, Danny, because normally I am much more interactive in the conversation. I often check myself to make sure that I am not taking that ego role where I'm overstepping the boundary and taking that precedence in the conversation. I love that. I love today that every question thus far that I've wrote out to ask yes. has had to be unspoken today. <laughs> Because yeah. simply where my mind went, we are going. <laughs> I want to reel that back. I am going to reel it back just a step here. What was the big impetus for you to make your big jump, shuck all the corporate, yeah. and spend this 10 years as a monk, and then finding that purposeful intention to have the focus of your mission being listening in the service of others very intently? What a great question. People so often ask me, what have you done to get to where you are? And unfortunately, I think my answer frustrates them a little bit because I don't think I've done anything. When we do those four practices that I just said, when we're kind to ourselves, when we allow ourselves to have a relationship with the one that's greater than us. <laughs> when we allow our purpose to have voice, when we invite connection to others, there's something really magical that happens. I wish I could say what it was, but I don't know. I just know that when we show up and we are real and we're authentic, real and authentic stuff happens. And I wish I could say it was always a bed of roses. It is, but roses have lots of thorns also. <laughs> Sometimes it's really painful. The reason we don't want to be vulnerable is because it can be really painful to be vulnerable. We can get hurt. The reason we don't want to take down our wall is because we can really smack ourselves hard. The reason we don't want to believe in one greater than us is because we have to accept the will of somebody else. we are lose control. That's scary. <laughs> I can tell you so many stories that I made up about myself and about my situation in my life. My dad died when I was 13 years old, and I believe he died because I didn't wake up to say goodbye to him before he went on a business trip. When he came in that evening and told me, don't wake up and say goodbye to me. I'm going to say goodbye to you right now before you go to sleep. I'm leaving at four o'clock in the morning. Don't worry about waking up. I love you. I'm kissing you. I'm hugging you. And I said, dad, there's no way I'm going to let you leave. He died six weeks later, making love to my mom of a heart attack. But I believed it was my fault <laughs> because I didn't wake up to say goodbye because I didn't want to live in a random world where bad things happen to people that I love for no reason at all. So I made up a story that I was the reason I was the cause that story is so not true, but I blame myself for lots and lots and lots of years for a story that had no basis in truth because it comforted me for a few moments. Hmm. How many other stories 
I've made up? How many other stories have our listeners made up that have zero truth, but we blame ourselves for not showing up? That's powerful. You so often remind us, and this brings us to recollection for me, nothing is as it seems. Nothing we see is what we see. No, it's what we see. It doesn't mean what we see is what is. Hmm. Everything we see is exactly that, what we see. But what we see is normally not what is. It's just what we see. And if you would think, the mosaic showed me that we're all connected. How is it possible we're all connected? Jeffrey, you're a good-looking guy wherever you are. I'm some old fat guy sitting in California. We're talking through a computer screen. Who in the world is ever going to say we're connected? It's impossible. You're where you are. I'm where I am. And how are we going to be connected to this world of 8 billion people? Mm. In a physical world, they're right. But science is even telling us that we're not made up of physicality. When we look at our bodies under a microscope, we don't see physicality. We see energy. We see cells moving quickly, circling, right? Mm. And we're made up of energy. That exhalation that you just had, I'm inhaling one moment later. Because energy travels without barriers, without distance, without time, without space for all of creation. Energy is energy. Mm -hmm. And we can live in different places at different periods of time when we connect to the energy that is. So you're really going to tell me you have pain in your body and you can't get rid of it? We're one connection away. Mm. We're one molecule away from feeling the, res- the solution to that coming into our bodies. But we don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that what I see is real. Hmm. What if it weren't? What if it were only my reality, but not the reality of anything bigger than me? Today's episode is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's your free platform for podcasting. Anchor has creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. So it's super easy to create your own podcast. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor is everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started sharing your story with the world. Coming back in, we're bringing back that notion of looking at creating our reality. We're always on that search for something bigger, something more, when that magic to me is always right there inside. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a hard thing for people to get. It's a hard thing for me to get. Are you really going to say to me that everything that I want is right inside of me? Yeah, it is. But we spend, we do rooms on Clubhouse. And our rooms are so powerful. But one of the precursors of every room that we do is we don't allow people to fix or help or change somebody. So someone comes and they're they're in trouble. They're aching. They're crying. They're feeling pain. Every single person in the in the room wants to reach out and say, It's okay if you do this, if you help, I can help you. I'll do this, I'll do this. And we say, please don't do that. Not because we're cold and we don't want people to experience compassion of giving to another person, but rather because there is a moment in time when the question we have that has no answers suddenly becomes the answer that knows no questions. And the discovery of that moment for every individual is so beautifully sacred. Why would we allow somebody to take that moment away Mm. by just giving something that they suggest the person do, which may or may may not be good for them? 
<laughs> rather than honor that within them is the answer to everything they need. Yes. If they would just stop focusing on what the problem is <laughs> and start listening to what their own self is saying is the solution. But that's hard to do. I have pain in my body. That pain I feel in my body. Last night, I'm being very vulnerable. Last night, my wife does energy, source energy alignment. She was in our room. Mm -hmm. She did a source energy alignment. She's done them a lot of times on me. I haven't felt that much. I haven't felt anything. Other people are telling me how much they feel. <laughs> Last night, she did a short source energy alignment mm -hmm. in, in a room that we were in. It probably lasted two minutes. I woke up this morning. I went to get my coffee. I noticed that the pain in my legs was gone. I didn't feel it. I was walking around like I used to walk around when I didn't have pain. Mm. You know where my mind went? Well, that can't be possible. Where's my pain? It didn't even want to accept the reality that was the reality of that moment. It wanted to go back. It went to back to the story that I created to be my reality because it's been so commonplace for me to feel that pain. Mm. So you're going to tell me now everything's inside of me? Mm. Really? Yeah, really. It is. And that shift of perception. That shift from problem to solution is cataclysmic. Everything changes in that moment. So often we can make that mission, that purpose yeah. to simply carry that pain. Yeah, I love that because you know how many people tell me, oh, Danny, you're so wonderful. You're so great. You're so good. You're so fabulous. And I said, look at my belly. Come on. I've got a big belly and I've got pain all through my body. It's been my, it's been my call to humanity of my normalness so what's my pain going to do it's going to stay around what's my belly going to do it's going to stay around because that's i mean it's my it's my greatest friend i'm saying to people look at me i'm all messed up look at this i'm overweight i got pain in my body like what do you what do you why would you look at me as somebody you want to be like you don't want to be like this I'm an old fat fuck from California. <laughs> Oops, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> we'll put a marker on that, you know. <laughs> us being all I'm an and old real, fat you know. <laughs> 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 I'm an old fat guy in California. You don't want to be like this. You don't want to fall in love with this. Mm. You want to fall in love with who you are. But it's so easy because people want to pedestal people. But the only way to go from a pedestal is to come crashing down. I don't want to be on a pedestal. I want to walk side by side with everybody that I meet. And when I fall down, ask for your help to pick me up. And when you fall down, I'll lay beside you until you're ready to get up. And I'll do whatever I can <laughs> to encourage you to get back up when you're ready. But I won't do it a moment before you're ready. You have every right to live your life exactly the way you want to. And so do I. And when we realize that, life becomes so beautiful. Hmm. At our source, we all want to feel seen, heard, listened to, and understood. And that source yeah. wants us to do yeah. the same to it. So I've had a really beautiful experience with those words that you just said. I've had a really beautiful opportunity to live a very, very diverse life. I grew up in a lower middle class family. My dad died with one suit and a mountain full of debt. We knew what poverty was. My mom died two years later because she couldn't deal with the loss of my dad. She loved him so much. <laughs> she died on exactly the same day at exactly the same time two years later. Suddenly my brother and I were by ourselves. We were making arrangements to live with my best friend's parents and his best friend's parents and they were going to take us in until my mom's sister who lived in the Midwest, we lived in the East Coast, said, oh no, it's obvious you're going to come and stay with us. Well, my uncle, my mom's sister's husband, was a household name around the world. But we didn't know him very well. We didn't know him at all. Because 50 years ago, the world was much bigger than it is now. Now, there was no internet. There was no email. There was no, there was no video conferencing calls. Um, <laughs> if you didn't see a person, you didn't see a person. <laughs> when we moved from the East Coast to the Midwest, 
that move of 2,000 miles was nothing compared to the move from a lower middle class family to an elite upper class family. Hmm. Suddenly, the people I I was hanging out with were some of the wealthiest people in the world. They were the sons and daughters of some of the wealthiest people. And I sat in their living rooms and had dinner with them in their dining room tables. I played with their children. I talked, I knew their grandparents. And they were kind enough on occasion to ask me what I thought about something. And even kinder to give me counsel so many times. And along my life, I realized that I had also a beautiful opportunity to walk on the streets of India with the poorest of the poor. And to sit on street corners with the homeless here in the United States and all throughout Europe. And I started to ask myself, what do all these people have in common? Is there anything that they have in common? They live behind different borders. They have different color skin. They practice different religions. They have different financial situations. One lives in a mansion. One lives in a cardboard box. What is it that they all share in common? Is there anything they all share in common? And what I realized is every single one of them one of the same three things. They wanted to be loved and accepted, listened to and heard, and acknowledged and validated. Didn't matter how much money they had or didn't matter. And the moment I realized that, everything in my life changed. I used to be a very well-paid fixer. I would go into businesses and I would fix them. I would go into families and I would fix them. I would go into government organizations and I would fix them. I would see what was wrong with the situation and I would fix it. Just like a little carpenter, I would see what's wrong. I'd tear it apart. I'd put it back together. A little bit messy, but I was really good at what I did. Mm. Until that moment where I started to see that I could love and accept people as they were. I could listen to them and hear them. And I could acknowledge and validate them. And when I did that, I realized nobody needed to be fixed. They just needed to be loved. So I left that career and I just started to love and accept people, listen to people and hear them and acknowledge and validate them. Here's what happened, Jeffrey. As I started to do that, I watched the walls that protected them because they didn't feel safe suddenly now drop because they did feel safe. And miracles started to happen in their life. (laughs) I only recently realized why those miracles were happening. Mm -hmm. because I had a fight with my beautiful beloved, the one that's bigger than me. And I said, why in the world don't you answer people's prayers? Like, what's wrong with you? Like, people are calling out to you, and I hear them all say, how can I believe in a God like that? They don't even answer their prayers. Look at all the suffering of people. Look at what's happening. I can't believe in one greater than me because they're not there. They're invisible. They don't listen. They don't answer. Mm -hmm. I said, how in the world could you let yourself be seen that way? This is serious. I want to know. Unfortunately, my beloved knows my temperament and was gentle with me. And she said to me, Danny, just on the other side of the wall that you built up to protect yourself is the answer to every prayer you've ever asked for. Mm. Some of them say no, but most of them are, are, are green lighted. But there's no access for you to get them because the wall you've put up, I won't go, I won't go through. Help people to drop those walls, drop your own walls. <laughs> and allow yourself to experience the magnificence of all these blessings that are waiting there for you just on the other side of the wall that you've used to protect you from pain. <laughs> it was then that I realized as I watched these people let their walls come down, they were receiving the answers to their prayers. Bodies were being healed. Businesses were, opportunities were coming to them. <laughs> Relationships were growing. Inner peace was part of their life once again. And they would thank me for it. I didn't do anything. I literally just held space for them to let down, to feel safe and receive all that was waiting for them. And the truth in that, none of us knows truly exactly how another human being feels. But to quote the great Brian H. McGill quote, one of the most sincere forms of respect is actually listening to what another simply has to say and then taking that a step further, yeah. simply opening our heart to them. I think the Dalai Lama said it beautifully for me. <laughs> he said, the more I speak, the more I just tell myself what I know. The more I listen, I have a chance to discover everything I don't know. Why not just listen? 
His answers are inside all along. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you, Danny, for opening your heart to us today and sharing this wonderful space with us, allowing us the opportunity to lean in, listen, connect, and truly feel that heart energy. Where can our listeners reach out to you to connect with your book and discover more about aligning with the pieces of their mosaic? So my book is available on Amazon. It's available as a beautiful hardcover, as a Kindle, or as an audio. Uh, It's also available in Audible for audio if you want to get it there. People seem to like my voice, so sometimes they like to have this. <laughs> I'm reading the book, so they seem it's very they, they seem to like it. <laughs> I think I'm the most boring person in the world because people are just get calm and shut. <laughs> There's a calm peacefulness that's that's inherent throughout all of your voice and all of your energy. You. So I I'm, I'm so grateful for that today. So they can get the book on Amazon in any one of those formats. Also, they can visit me on my website, danielbrucelevin.com. I'm sure that will be in the show notes for people to be able to see. <laughs> or they can go to the mosaiconline.com. All the social media places will be seen there. We're starting to develop our Instagram account because of Clubhouse. Clubhouse says, uses that as a way to, for us to interact with each other. So Instagram mm. uh, is starting to become more beautiful and more uh, developed. Yes. One of the things that we're doing on Instagram right now, we're just about to start, is I wrote a card deck also for the Mosaic. Mm. Because when I was at Hay House, I created the card decks for them. They weren't there before. Nobody had done them. I mean, there were tarot cards, but I took the I took the card decks of the authors and made card decks out of them. Yes. And so I wrote a card deck for myself, but I never published it. We're starting to tell in short video, 30-second clips, we're starting to introduce the characters of the mosaic because what I found is in this book, it's not a stale, stagnant portrayal of a character that used to be, but the mosaic is a living, breathing entity. The fact that you're listening now to this hmm. means the mosaic has already found you. The question is now, what will you allow it to happen? Will you allow your peace to connect to its peace? And I mean that as P I E C E and P E A C E. And once we, we all know. I'm sorry. Sorry, there again. I I overstepped a little. We all know there are multiple pieces to that puzzle. (laughs) Yes, yes. And someone told me just very recently that he he was the one that was helpful to getting the alchemist out. And he read the mosaic because people have compared it to the alchemist. And he said, I have to tell you, I was uneasy at the end of it. And I said, tell me, I'm very interested. He said, I know the story ends and I know there's completion in it, but I didn't feel a sense of completion. <laughs> and I said, tell me more. He said, well, I prefer you to tell me what's going on since you wrote it. And I told him that through the process of that book, I met people that were creating an NFT with using a story from that book an artist and a musician and a healer and a storyteller creating an NFT from that. I, somebody else came to me and said, I want to create a clothing line based on the, on the ideas in the mosaic. Hmm. Someone else came to me and said, I want to start a business with you around something entirely different. So he said, okay, now I get it. The reason the mosaic doesn't feel complete is because the mosaic is never complete. It's always bringing in more pieces. And if you look at what the book is doing, It's literally generating to you those pieces to help the message of it get out. Jeffrey, you're one of those pieces. By just being able to have this conversation with you, it literally is bringing together the pieces of its mosaic. And anybody who connects with it, it will bring together the pieces of their life too. It allows them to come up more whole, more full, never fully complete, but more fully complete than they've been. And I thought that was such an interesting way Mm. of seeing what the book actually is doing. What a beautiful message in asking ourselves that vital question, simply how am I being purposefully in service of our source and others? I love that. If we were to take five words, it's what I've done. I've taken these five words as my mantra. Nothing is as 
it seems. <laughs> if we were to understand that nothing is as it seems, nothing, it would allow the curiosity of our mind to then ask, if it isn't what I think it is, what is it? And just the curiosity of that question would allow us to see the world from a different perspective. I remember when I was at Hay House sitting with Wayne Dyer at lunch. Over the course of the time, he discovered one of the sayings that he became really well known for. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, Danny, Danny, when you change the way you see the world, the world you see changes. That's the result of nothingness, as it seems. <laughs> that beautiful opportunity to change the way we see the world. So the world we live in changes. <laughs> the mosaic of who we are shows up differently. It aligns to who we are inwardly and who we are outwardly. I want people to read the book, not because of the dollars that will put in my pocket. It's twelve. It's twelve dollars and fifty cents, something like that. It's not <laughs> right. That's not what the, what this is all about. I'd like people to read the book or listen to the story because I'd like to know what's possible with you if you were able to change the way you see your world. What would you see? I thank you, brother. What a wonderful, wonderful view to sit with today. What might be when we simply ask ourselves, what might be? And then lean in to listen. I truly want to thank you wholeheartedly today, Danny. This has been such a wonderful opportunity to listen, connect, and just feel that love and energy flowing through you. So thank you, my friend. I love you. Thank you so much for my heart. Thank you so much, brother, for having me here with you. I truly want to thank you for allowing us to listen to you, to allow our listening community to thank connect. You. And thank you, thank you thank for you, sharing that you, with you. us today. It's been such a blessing and a gift. Let's do it again soon. Would love that. I would love if this is the start of something, not the end of something. As you say, you know, it's all a piece of the mosaic. What is the bigger picture? Where do we go next? What a wonderful alchemy and magic to just have present for us to create and be. Love it. Thank you so much. My honor. Thank you. If you wish your merit to be known, acknowledge that of other people. Kindness is choosing to acknowledge and celebrate the beauty in others, regardless of whether or not they find it in themselves. Poet Anita Krizan tells us, we are mosaics, pieces of light, love, history, and stars, glued together with magic and music and words, instilling us the belief that the very essence of our being is formed from our experiences, relationships, inspiration, and a dash of cosmic beauty. If you would spend just 10 minutes with someone you didn't know, letting them tell you who they are, their life would change. If all of us did just that, the world too would change by understanding that we are all a tiny piece of a much larger mosaic, infinitely connected beyond anything we can imagine. Danny and I have discussed a lot today about fitting the pieces of your mosaic together, but now we want to know what you, our valued listener, found meaningful in today's show. If you found significantly meaningful value in our conversation, please drop us a note or send us comments of appreciation by visiting us at www.thelightinside.us or tag us on social media at The Light Inside Podcast, sharing what inspired you the most in this episode. We are grateful to be able to continue helping you, our valued listening community, discover your light inside. Remember to continue to support the growth of our program by sharing feedback or leaving us a review on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you find your favorite show. Sharing with others why you enjoy our program here at The Light Inside. Joining us next week is Scott Perry, where we'll share a conversation showing you how to create on purpose, guiding you to learn how to differentiate between work you have to do and the work you love and want to do. Tune in next week to find out more on The Light Inside.